Tornado on the ground, tornado on the ground. We see debris cloud on the ground. There's a small funnel above it. We're going to leave parking on the street. Call the debris cloud. And we could see the wrapping rain curtain. We got out of there. There was quite a few cars on that bridge on I-40. Now, I just pray that they it went west of them, but it came very close. So. Oh, you know what? We can hear it. Oh, my gosh. Gary, this thing is roaring. Get the video camera. I want to turn around. <laughs> there it is right there. There it is right there. God, man, this thing is big. We can hear it roaring. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly. I have a big announcement coming up in the next month. I've started a brand and I'm working very hard on it behind the scenes, which is why I'm not able to upload weekly right now, but I promise it'll be worth it. I am so excited to show you guys what I've been working on this entire summer and yeah. That's all I'm gonna say for now. I will have more information on that in the next video and then some launch dates and different things. So yeah, just um, keep your eyes open for that. If you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you'll see that I've already talked about it a little bit and I'll definitely have more information on my social medias than I'll be able to update here on YouTube. Huge shout out and thank you to my members who keep the dream alive for me and support me in a way that allows me to make this content and pursue things. Hopefully this is going to become a full-time job for me in the next year and members are helping me make that a reality. So just thank you so much for that support. It means a lot to me. Yeah, with that out of the way, let's get right into the video. Amid the vast landscapes of America's heartland, there lies a time where the elements come together for the atmosphere to become violent. At times in a way so immense, so powerful, that it captures the nation's attention. The date was May 24th, 2011, a day that would etch itself in Oklahoma history as the atmosphere prepared to give one of its most truly terrifying displays of seemingly boundless power. In the world of meteorology, the 2011 El Reno tornado and the community itself have somewhat of a gravitational pull. Not only was this twister the apex of meteorological potential, over the years El Reno would continue to be the reason why communities would be brought together. Today, we journey through the story of the 2011 Piedmont El Reno EF5. It is impossible to talk about any major tornadoes from the year 2011 without taking a look at the greater context that was one of the most active and deadly years for tornadoes in recorded history. To say the spring of 2011 was brutal for tornadoes would be an understatement, and by the end of the year, more than 550 people lost their life to a tornado, which is exponentially higher than the average 70 tornado-related fatalities per year. So it's in this very grim context, only two days after Joplin and several weeks after the April 27th outbreak, that we get the Piedmont El Reno tornado. May 24th, 2011. The SBC has already highlighted areas of concern as severe weather was expected to move over the area in an active pattern. On the morning of the Piedmont tornado, a strong upper-level trough progressed through the Great Plains region, taking on a negative tilt. 
And the negative tilt in the trough is important because it means that a stronger surface low is developing, usually resulting in a large change in wind direction with height or wind shear, which aids in the formation of supercell thunderstorms and ultimately is more conducive for tornadoes. And if you've watched the meteorological breakdown for the April 27th event, you know that it too was characterized by a strong negatively tilted trough. Along with this wicked kinematic setup, CAPE values, or atmospheric instability, reached values between 2,500 and 4,000 joules per kilogram. And for reference, anything around and above 4,000 joules per kilogram is considered extreme. That's a lot of energy for the atmosphere to work with and is essentially, as James Spann would call it, a powder keg. By the late morning, a shortwave embedded trough advanced rapidly, pushing the dry line into western Oklahoma where it would eventually meet with that moist air. In light of the convergence of these factors, the Storm Prediction Center had issued a high risk spanning from Texas through majority of central Oklahoma into Kansas. Along with the high risk, an astonishing 45% hatched risk for tornadoes was placed over a majority of central Oklahoma. At 12.50 p.m., the SPC issues a PDS tornado watch for most of central and eastern Oklahoma. Given that residents are no stranger to these kind of tornado days, many people are actively preparing plans to either be at home or have access to a storm shelter, which for many would be a decision that would ultimately save their life later in the day. By 2 p.m., convection begins to fire off at the dry line in southwestern Oklahoma, where the storms would have that explosive energy to work with. While the storms would initially begin as showers and light convection, the storms in this environment will very quickly turn into supercell thunderstorms, becoming severe and, in many cases on this day, tornadic. By 2.30 p.m., one of those singular storms formed off the dry line, would begin tracking discreetly through southwestern Oklahoma, gaining intensity as it becomes now a powerhouse supercell. Tornado warnings sound through Caddo County. For roughly 15 minutes after 3.31 p.m. Very large wet trail, about a, I would say about three quarters of a mile to a mile wide now. We've got a very large tornado. A tornado continues on the ground there. Take your immediate tornado precautions. And for you, those of you new to this area, uh, below ground is best. Uh, this tornado is west of Canadian County. It's about 40 miles west of the Oklahoma County line. It's apparently a huge tornado. Bobby, what's your estimate on the direction of the movement? We show it about east northeast. Oh, This initial tornado would cause EF2 and EF3 intensity damage, largely over rural land. Eventually, the mesocyclone begins to broaden, followed by a period of weakening as a second mesocyclone now begins to develop, causing the first one to decay. By 3.47 p.m., while the first tornado completely dissipates, the second mesocyclone was only beginning to strengthen, this time getting ready to produce something much more powerful and sinister. Moments later, just north of the community of Niles, Oklahoma, the second and much more intense tornado would touch down. The Piedmont El Reno tornado has just been born. Within moments, the twister has gone from EF0 to EF2 intensity, crossing over the Canadian River and moving northeast. With a supercell like this, it wouldn't take long for an intensification to occur. Uh, but Oh, now I'm seeing it a little bit better, Gary. It's a large tornado on the ground. It's incredible how big it's humongous, Gary. This thing is a large tornado. We're looking uh, west-southwest at it. It's, it's, it's a humongous wedge. It's within mere minutes of this touchdown that the twister is already causing violent EF4 damage. The tornado is already taking on the appearance of a massive menacing wedge. In less than five minutes, the tornado has gone from a funnel still in the sky to being touched down on the ground to now being a massive wedge with violent intensity. Almost incredibly, it's here already that the Piedmont El Reno twister reaches EF5 intensity very briefly for the first of several times in its life. 
And you see here, interstate's right along Interstate 40. So it looks like it's east, northeast, about 40 miles an hour. So no telling just where in there it's going to come down. But apparently it's been on Interstate 40, which is bad news. So once again, if you have friends or you know anyone that's trying to travel west right now, call them and uh, tell them to get off of it. If you're coming, know someone coming from the west into this, don't go past Bridgeport. And although it's not hitting many structures at this point early on in its life, that was able to capture some incredible raw data from this storm. The Doppler station less than two miles from the storm captures something incredible. The quote, first mobile Doppler radar data set of an EF5 tornado. 72 feet above the ground, a maximum velocity was recorded a staggering 295 miles per hour. Some of the fastest wind speeds ever recorded on the planet. And this wasn't for a brief period of time either. Almost unbelievably, multiple consecutive radar scans averaged a two second radial velocity of 265 miles per hour, which would later be reported as, quote, likely an underestimate of the true two and four second average wind speeds. So it's at this intensity that the radar captures that the twister is now moving over Elm Street, causing multiple points of EF5 damage as it now begins to move towards and eventually over Interstate 40. Yeah. Oh, we got it again. We got it again. Go ahead, Val. Uh, we have tornadoes on the ground uh, north of I-40 now, Carrie. This thing is so big, it's, uh, it's completely rain-wrapped, but we can just see tremendous big rain curtains. And it's just north of I-40. It's a half a mile. It's on I-40 and stretches. Oh, you know what? We can hear it. Oh, my gosh. Gary, this thing is roaring. Get the video camera. I want to turn around. <laughs> there it is right there. There it is right there. God, man, this thing is big. We can hear it roaring. It's uh, injuries, but uh, it's on the ground. Wrapped, and we can see the wrapping rain curtains. We got out of there. There was quite a few cars on that bridge on I-40. Now, I just pray that they it went west of them, but it came very close, so. El Reno tornado, as it moves over I-40, would become deadly. Terry Peoples lost his life in his pickup truck, along with Don Wesley Krug and his wife, Joan, as they were both thrown across the highway several thousand feet. And that's all I'm really going to say about their loss of life. Very tragic. Regretfully, these weren't the only losses of life that came from being on the road. Two more fatalities would occur in another vehicle just northeast of the I-40 crossing moments later. In addition to those fatalities, the horrifying theme of cars being caught off guard and thrown in this storm would lead to dozens more injuries as vehicles were hurled, torn apart, and caked in mud, even on the very far edges or outer skirts of this horrifying tornado, which by the way, at its peak was just over a mile in width. While the areas just before and around Interstate 40 had widespread EF4 and even some concentrated areas of EF5 damage, shockingly, the most intense parts of the tornado were yet to come. The next target of the El Reno Twister was the Cactus 117 oil rig. The Cactus Drilling Company, owner of the Cactus 117 oil drilling site near El Reno, owns just over 40 rigs throughout Oklahoma, one of which, the Cactus 117 rig, resided just north of Interstate 40 and was about to become the next target of the Piedmont tornado at the most intense point of its life. I can tell you that the inflow has really picked up. It has really gotten rough up here, and uh, that's about all I can tell you right now, Gary. We're yeah, just trying to stay a uh, safe distance away. As the mile-wide storm moved over the facility, the rig's drill head and pipes were pushed into the well's borehole, pressuring the drilling pipe with 200,000 pounds of downforce. The rig itself, weighing just over 2 million pounds, was not only pushed to the side, 
It incredibly was rolled several times after that. Incredibly, nobody was killed here, and not because the twister wasn't strong at this point. The entire rig and all of the machinery around it were completely destroyed and mangled. The reason the employees survived was for one reason and one reason alone, company planning. While tornado drills had always been a regular part of company policy, like many other companies, it wasn't until the year 2007 when a tornado blew a trailer house over on site that Cactus decided to implement a tornado-proof area for the employees. So on May 24th, 2011, when some of the strongest winds ever recorded on Earth literally moved over the Cactus 117 oil rig, all of the employees not only survived, but escaped major injury because of that decision to implement a tornado safe area. I'll be honest, I don't like that this is considered exemplary company behavior for there to be a tornado shelter. The unfortunate reality is that there are far more stories that we've talked about on this channel of people losing their lives at work because they're is some sort of flaw in planning or execution or lack of tornado shelters than stories of companies going above and beyond to protect employees. While I do very seriously applaud and commend the Cactus Company for having the tornado shelters, I also want to say in the same breath that I just wish that this was the standard rather than the exception for companies generally. After causing EF5 damage over the oil rig, the intensity of the twister begins to taper off just for a few moments as it now moves north and west of the community of El Reno. Here it moves over several businesses including a farmhouse, repair shop, and a grain storage facility, most of which were labeled destroyed beyond any repair. Debris taken from these structures was hurled at such a velocity and distance that they actually pierced a natural gas processing plant, creating a major gas leak which would cause problems for nearby residents for weeks. Sky News 9, we had reports of uh, homes being leveled in Lukiba, and there's a huge <laughs> smoke out in there, could still have the tornado on the ground. So we're watching that particular storm. It's north of Interstate 40. If you live uh, Okarchi in south, or you live near Piedmont, or you live in northwestern Oklahoma County and north sections of El Reno, uh, continue with your tornado precautions. This thing is continues to be very significant. We've had reports of a lot of damage. We understand that I-40 is in gridlock, and that's not a good thing to happen. Um, it looks like to me, luckily, it's going to miss El Reno to the northwest, at least the main part of town. Still traveling on that highway. They need to uh, be aware of what's going on. We, the tornado is so big. Powerful tornado is uh, the power flashes. And this was the extent of the weakened version of the El Reno storm as it now geared up once again just before moving over the residential areas of Piedmont. By the time the twister reaches Piedmont, Oklahoma, just after 4.30 p.m., EF4 intensity winds are once again being unleashed on the homes in the northern edge of the community. Ten homes on North Ridge Lane were struck, many of which structurally failed and were destroyed, some of which were even slapped, leaving nothing but the foundations where families once lived. Dozens more homes after this would be hit in the next 15 minutes of absolute horror as it moved over the Piedmont suburbs. Now this thing's coming directly at you, you really need uh, below ground shelter, all right? But if you don't have that, you get in the closet or bathroom in the middle part of the house and get down there and stay down. It's hard to fully express, let alone fathom in our minds, the kind of damage that was being done here, but I think this next description helps a little bit. It was in the onslaught of the twister that a Chevy Avalanche was picked up, and here it was thrown 700 yards before hitting a tree at such a force that the engine block and axles were ripped from the body and found some distance away. It would also be here in this residential area where two very young children lost their life in their home without a tornado shelter. This was the exact event they tell you about when they say it's hard to survive if you're not underground. 
or if you're not in a certified tornado shelter, that's exactly what this was. In total, 88 homes in the Piedmont area were completely destroyed. After 40 miles of devastation and horror in Canadian County, the Twister is now moving into Kingfisher and Logan counties where it thankfully begins to weaken. When I say weaken, we're talking about going from EF5 to EF3 intensity damage, which is still very strong. And that becomes evident because we see yet another two fatalities here by individuals who were caught off guard outside at the time with no shelter to protect them. In its last leg of life, the El Reno Piedmont Twister is doing its best to cause its last bit of damage. And finally, after an hour and a half of seemingly unfathomable power, the El Reno Piedmont Twister dissipates just north of the community of Guthrie, Oklahoma. By the end of May 24th, 2011, 22 tornadoes had moved through the Great Plains. Taylor uh, is live this morning, uh, field anchoring for us. And Leanne, you said you had some new information concerning this missing child. Rich, you know, as is often the case when you're dealing with a tragedy like this, that information comes in spurts. Sometimes it's duplicated, sometimes it's misunderstood. We want to clarify that we have uh, updated information that the child that is in uh, the hospital is Kathleen uh, Hamill. It's a little girl, not a little boy, and she is uh, in the hospital in the Oklahoma City area, five years old. She is one of a family that was torn apart by this tornado last night here in Piedmont. 15-month-old Cole the little brother passed away this morning. The medical examiner has confirmed that information. And the little boy, Ryan, three-year-old toddler, is missing. Now, we just got word literally minutes ago that officers are beginning the search. They are bringing in uh, canine rescue search dogs, and they are going to be going around Falcon Lake here in the next hour. In total, the tornado carved a 60-mile path through the state of Oklahoma. In the immediate aftermath, first responders worked to clear areas, searching for victims and anyone who's injured or trapped in the rubble. In the coming days, workers and neighbors begin to sift through the unbelievable damage, finding their cars in trees hundreds of feet away, homes across the street completely gone, their belongings mangled, trees debarked. Almost unreal damage. Within days after the event, a survey team examined the storm's path and damage and it came up pretty quickly with a preliminary rating, EF4. Many times the preliminary rating doesn't change unless there is any new information or data that's gathered that can warrant a higher EF5 rating. And that actually would be the case for the Piedmont tornado. There is a little bit of controversy to this rating, which will come as no surprise to many of you when we have these upper echelon tornadoes. To summarize the rating controversy here, technically from this event, there were no official EF5 damage indicators. This really meant that there were no buildings that had the structural integrity to have received the kind of damage where they would have been able to give it the EF5 rating, which is why it got that preliminary EF4. However, given the information that was subsequently collected from the Cactus 17 oil rig, in addition to the mobile Doppler radar that was collected, the team of brilliant minds, including Tim Marshall, had decided that this was an extraordinary storm and needed to have a rating to match that. By June 1st, 2011, the Piedmont El Reno tornado was upgraded from an EF4 to an EF5 rating. This actually made the El Reno Twister the first to ever receive the EF5 rating in the state of Oklahoma since the scale was changed to the EF scale back in 07, and it remains one of only two ever EF5 tornadoes in the state of Oklahoma, the second one of course being more 2013. Uh, sadly, we're going to come to you today and tell you that uh, in this storm, uh, we, we did locate our 10th victim. Uh, Ryan Hamill was uh, found this morning about 7.15 uh, near the shoreline at Falcon Lake and uh, reunited with their, their child was very emotional. Uh, the National Guard was a tremendous help. There was emergency managers from not only 
local county, but state agencies as well. Uh, they were all of great, great assistance. I just want to thank everybody for helping and being there. And it's a bad deal. I lost both of my boys. <laughs> so, I was hoping we'd find Ryan today in life. <laughs> Ryan was my little buddy. Co was too. I loved them both. I just want to thank everybody again for helping all they've done. In total, the El Reno Piedmont Twister took nine lives and injured 181 residents. The fatalities accounted for a majority of the 11 lives that were lost from the entire outbreak on May 24th. The American Meteorological Society went on to publish a paper that was later discussed at their annual conference in which the National Weather Service actually speculated that the fatalities for this event were lower than they really could have been. The reasoning of which was due in part to, quote, the incredible reaction of the community to not only watches and warnings, but also to the forecast of severe weather. Ultimately, given the sheer violence and intensity of this storm, yes, it could have been worse, but I don't even really like to say that because nine lives is still a lot of lives lost and two of which were really young children. So I don't even like to really say that because that's a... Um, a horrific loss of life in itself. One of the other important points I do want to talk about while we're discussing fatalities are the number of car fatalities and injuries that were seen from this event. Car fatalities play a particularly important role in Oklahoma, and we've talked about this so many different times, why sheltering under overpasses is not okay. But the fact that there were so many car injuries here and multiple car fatalities alludes to, in my opinion, a bigger problem, whether that is people who were genuinely caught off guard, meaning maybe they weren't weather aware, maybe they didn't really know that the twister was right in front of them, or maybe some people thought, some people who were injured maybe thought that they could outrun the storm. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why you might be caught up in a storm, but it does allude to a larger problem of why are these people on the road anyways when they knew it was going to be a dangerous weather day. Let's talk about recovery. Given the fact that the communities of El Reno and Piedmont were relatively small, the closeness of the communities here really began to shine through after this tornado. The day after the storm, a family rebuilds in El Reno. We've made some good progress. We've sifted through everything and gotten all that we could salvage, and we have uh, have two rollaway dumpsters, fill those up. We've really had 20 to 30 people here helping that just stopped by to help. Uh, probably had a dozen people drop by with food and, and uh, drinks and water and everything, so we're, we're making good progress. In the days after the outbreak, the long and painful cleanup process began starting with the cleanup of individuals' homes after the search and rescue process has concluded. The city of Piedmont would pay $230,000 for debris removal, 75% of which was covered by FEMA. And this would be the beginning of an incredibly long journey. Residents now had to endure the cleanup process, which is not a weeks long process, it's not a month long process, it's a years long process. Many of these people had to rebuild their homes literally from the ground up and would be displaced for a significant amount of time. And this is long after the media comes in and leaves. These people are stuck with no home and, and a significant amount of problems. And all they're left with is trying to build up some semblance of normalcy. Crews worked into the evening hours to restore service. Tom Cronister, his family and friends started at dawn and worked hard throughout the day to clear away the debris. Cronister and his family were able to receive enough warning to seek refuge two miles south, undoubtedly saving their lives. I'm not from Oklahoma, but I feel like I can say this after having covered so many disasters in the state that I feel like Oklahomans are somewhat of a different breed and that they all have this shared understanding of tornado weather and caring for one another during tornado weather. They'll take care of strangers. They'll take in people they don't know to their storm shelter. 
and in the aftermath they are absolutely unquestionably there for each other doesn't matter if it's the first time you've seen this person after the event the oklahoma governor declared a state of emergency for 68 counties from the outbreak and by june 6th then president barack obama approved the request for federal disaster relief which of course opens up a lot of doors for funding for not only individuals but for businesses unfortunately the monetary damage estimate that was done by the national weather service was never publicly released some insurance officials estimated insured private property loss to be between two and three hundred million dollars from the outbreak although i want to make it clear that's not the official number the only monetary damage totals we know for sure are the ones that were given out by public companies the cactus rig for example amassed a total of 14 million dollars of damage the Devon Energy Natural Gas Plant was forced offline after the gas leaks we talked about, ultimately totaling to $140 million in repairs needed and for the time that they spent offline. Some months later in September of 2011, Governor Fallon and emergency management officials decided to announce the Sooner Safe Safe Room program, which used FEMA funds to distribute cash rebates for Oklahomans who wanted to build a storm shelter in their home or in their business, particularly for the ones who were previously affected. And slowly but surely in the months and years after the El Reno Piedmont tornado, people slowly began to rebuild what was lost. Which by the way feels very disconnected for me to say. You're never going to be able to rebuild your life to what it was. You can only sort of build something new and try to keep some of the old things that you used to have you might have been lucky enough to have saved part of your house but i don't know it feels disingenuous sometimes for me to even say people could fully rebuild because a lot of times you just can't but nonetheless in principle many of the people in el reno and piedmont specifically did rebuild their homes and start their lives back over The legacy of El Reno doesn't stop with the 2011 twister. As we all know, only two years later, El Reno would end up being the final resting place for Tim Samaras, Paul Samaras, and many other victims who lost their lives in a catastrophic flooding event from the 2013 El Reno twister. In some ways, the name El Reno in and of itself sparks some sort of eerie and ominous feeling, especially if you're someone who's familiar with the weather enterprise and the kind of history of tornadoes in that area. And it's even stranger to me to think about the year or talk about the year 2011 and the amount of intense twisters, record-breaking twisters in 2011, to think about that one singular year and then to, you know, fast forward to now where we haven't had an EF5 tornado in over 10 years feels very strange. What's interesting also to me about 2011 is that it wasn't that long ago and it's something we all remember. It was such a prolific year that you just remember it. And I've been so fortunate that so many of you have been willing to share your very deeply personal tornado experiences and stories with me or stories from your parents. It's very humbling and I don't know, just gives me a lot more perspective into how impactful these events are when I can read, you know, so many different people's real experiences with them, no matter how raw or traumatic or sad they might be. But if I have to say something positive, if I have to leave off on a positive note, I'll say that we today can be thankful for the amount of social science that came out of 2011 after the super outbreak and after Joplin and so many different events that were completely altering. And that's all we can really ask for is when we have a completely devastating, shattering, horrific event is that at the very least we can take something from it and learn from it and move forward in a way to honor those who have lost their lives is to be better moving forward. And I think despite all the gruesome nature that 2011 brought for tornadoes, we have found ways to be better. That's what I have for today. Kind of heavy. I'm sorry about that. I think I need Blaze for a hug or something. That was kind of an intense one. I'm going to uh, go cuddle Blaze 
And I hope you all will do something a little more positive with your day. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. And thank you all so much for sharing your stories and experiences with me. It means a lot. I'll see you guys in the next one.
One of the other interesting scientific findings that I found particularly horrifying after the fact was that this twister was calculated to have a forward speed of 36 miles per hour, which is quite slow. And similar to how Gerald played out, this really contributed to the amount of damage that occurred because you have this sort of slow churning effect that happens and a lot of the rubble ends up being really finely ground up. 